Oh, it's nice to see all the attendees coming in. This is good. I don't know. Well, you keep the music going. It's good. All right. Well, I'm just, uh, my name is uh, Chris Hahn. I am uh, the Dean for the Algonquin Center for Construction Excellence and the Perth campus. And I'm just gonna wait just about 30 seconds or so. We've got about 18 attendees, but just in case we have uh, a few more coming in, I see a couple more coming in. And for those that are already in the room, good day and welcome to virtual AC day one. So do a quick 10 second countdown and then we'll get started. A couple more. All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Virtual AC Day One. So again, my name is Chris Hahn. I'm the Dean for the Algonquin Center for Construction Excellence, and as well the Dean for the Perth campus in our community out in Perth, Ontario. I'm very happy to be here, very excited to kick off this winter semester with you. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. I just do want to introduce first uh, my boss, <laughs> Chris Jansen. So Chris, to give a wave, Chris is our uh, Senior Vice President Academic. Um, you may have gotten an email or two from him over the course of uh, the lead up to the start of the winter term. Um, second uh, little housekeeping item is that this event does include live closed captions in English. So captions are available directly in the Zoom toolbar. So you should see on your toolbar at the bottom something that says closed caption. It's got a little CC icon. And uh, if you click that, you'll be able to get the, uh, the closed captions. As well, on the bottom of the screen, you're gonna see a chat box. And uh, if you click chat, you feel free to use that feature. You could, if you want right now, you could introduce yourself, uh, maybe let us know what program you're in, anything else you'd like us to know that's appropriate. We'll put it that way. Um, if you have any questions though, for our special guests, and I'll introduce them in a moment, you can type those in the Q&A tab. There is at the very bottom a Q&A tab, and um, you can uh, click a question in there uh, and then we'll ask our special guests uh, the question. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So as, you, uh, as we progress, just type them in there and I'll make sure that they get asked at the end of the session. One final thing is that this session is being recorded and it will be added to the Algonquin College orientation website by the end of the week. So right now I'm pleased to introduce and welcome our two special guests uh, from Cabinscape, Laura Mendez and her husband, John Lochner. So Laura and John are the co-owners of Cabinscape. You may have seen their cabins uh, across the Instagram social media channel. Very happy that they're here uh, with us today uh, to talk about a few things. I, I think there would be real interest in your company and its uh, marketing success and potentially maybe even during the pandemic, how you've been able to sustain that, as well as some of the architecture of your cabins, the building techniques you use, uh, the creative interiors, um, and where they are. It's, and one final note on this, let's note that Cabinscape is a Canadian-owned and operated company uh, with several cabins right across Ontario. So I think uh, you'll be getting some folks to want to stay with you, Laura and John, after this. So I'm going to turn it over to you and so you can begin your presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our session. Um, I'm Laura Mendez and this is John. And as you know, we're the founders of Cabinscape. We design and we build uh, off-grid tiny cabins in the wilderness. We, we currently have 12 cabins across Ontario. And if all goes according to plan, uh, we'll hopefully have about 10, 12 more cabins by next summer. So uh, we started Cabinscape about three and a half years ago. Um, we, we ultimately, we started the company because of our daughter. Uh, before becoming parents, we were really big into backcountry canoe trips, camping trips, uh, we would take off for a week at a time. We just loved being out in the wilderness, isolated. Uh, but then we had our daughter and that sort of changed everything. 
Um, and obviously there was all these reservations about taking our, our you know, little toddler into a canoe out into the wilds of Algonquin Park. So that's when we really started to research and try to find alternative accommodations that could give us what we were wanting um, in, in a backcountry camping trip. Um, of course, we went to Airbnb and we started searching out these types of accommodations uh, and, and we couldn't really find anything. You know, of course, there's tons of accommodations on Airbnb, tons of cabins, tons of cottages, but mostly what we were finding are cottages sandwiched beside cottages, um, docks beside docks, and we really couldn't find anything that, that could give us what we wanted, which was, you know, remoteness out in the wilderness. Also, at the time, we were really wanting to find low carbon vacation options. So we were searching for off grid accommodations and and really we couldn't find anything. And, and that's when John had this crazy idea. Let's let's do this. Let's build our own tiny cabin. Um, and at the time, I thought it was just a crazy idea, uh, but somehow he convinced me and that's really how it started, um, building our first cabin, and that's the Auburn cabin you see here on our screen. Um, this cabin was built on the fly uh, with the help of a, a family friend who is a general contractor. Uh, we built this in our uh, John sister's backyard, and it took a while, uh, but we finally finished and we, we put it on Airbnb. Our first cabin was on Airbnb. We also started an Instagram account and that proved to be um, huge for us. Uh, the photo that you see on our screen um, on the right side is the first photo that we posted to our Instagram account. And this photo went viral, I, I don't know, it just, kind of spread everywhere. All these major tiny house accounts were posting it. Airbnb posted it. Ontario Travel posted it. And from there, we just started building up a following. Um, we quickly booked up our summer weekends and weekdays, and we were just booked solid. And it was an incredible feeling. Um, and we knew then that we were, we were onto something. Uh, this photo here is of John and our daughter at the time. Um, we, we knew that we wanted to continue doing this. It was such an incredible experience. And so we decided to build one more cabin. Um, here's another photo of our, of our Auburn cabin here. Um, and when I say tiny, tiny, we were building these on trailer beds. Uh, this is uh, 160 square feet. Uh, this is our Mason cabin. This is our second cabin that we built. Uh, we also put that on Airbnb and we also posted uh, some photos to Instagram. This photo in particular of me on the bed was another photograph that really went viral and uh, really shot up our followers and um, and really it's as I said Instagram has been huge for for really attracting our customer base um, and and really after that, we, we were like, okay, this is, we're on to something, let's continue doing this. And, and because of all of the exposure that we received through Instagram, we started to build up really incredible partnerships with uh, municipalities, conservation authorities, private landowners. And then it really became a matter of trying to find the right suitable land uh, to, to develop these cabins. And, and we're talking about land that is remote, that is nearby uh, great parks, nearby um, great trails, um, but that isn't too far away from your creature comforts and from local towns. Like Mason Cabin, for example, is in Mountain Grove. It's not too far away from um, Charbot Lake that has a great coffee shop. So really our interest was building these off-grid uh, tiny cabins um, in remote locations, but not too far away from from local towns that you could really get to experience um, the local communities in the areas of our cabins. Um, maybe John, you want to take it from there? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sort of coming up with the designs and some of the um, just sort of the architectural approach. Um, I'm not an architect. Um, I, I did do a lot of the design or we worked together in various ways on a lot of the design work. Um, like Laura said, with the first Auburn cabin, that was kind of um, flying by the seat of our pants a little bit. But 
um, since then we've done, um, we've progressed a long way. So the cabins that we're building now are, we all have uh, architectural drawings. They've been through engineering review. Um, they're all stamped. Um, we're currently, we're just finishing up actually being CSA certified. So um, most of the cabins that we build moving forward would also be what the CSA Z240 manufactured homes. So um, people could technically live with them, live in them, although that's not really the, the design intent. Um, but we've we've come a long way from that initial sort of flying by the seat of our pants, trying it out um, to uh, really nailing down and making sure that everything is to code um, and optimized. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of from the top level. Um, one thing I want to talk about is is really just uh, the idea of approaching like design with a philosophy. And I'll talk about some of those sort of the core tenets of our philosophy in, in putting these cabins together. Um, so for us, a, a lot of what Laura had talked about was the intent was, you know, we want to get in, out into wilderness spaces. Um, so being close to trails, being close to paddling um, and really engaging with the outdoors. So one of the reasons that we felt like we could get away with being so small is um, partially because it's intended to be a short term stay. People are usually staying two or three um, two or three days. Um, but also the whole idea is we want the cabin to be a base camp um, for people to then get out and explore. Um, so one of the main sort of ideas from the beginning was breaking down sort of the walls or making it sort of an indoor outdoor space and it not really being, you know, it, when you're inside, you're not necessarily inside all the time. Um, so we talked about doing, for example, like a Muskoka room outside as a separate sort of part. But as we as we pulled the design together, you know, we came up with this the the sort of garage door, indoor outdoor bars, one of our sort of signatures. Um, and but that was just and that the, the idea of a garage door ended up coming from you know what's the what's the best way that we can really open up a wall. And there's different types of approaches to that. There's accordion windows, um, but they you know take up too much space or there's, there's so many ways that they just don't work. So we ended up with this sort of garage door, indoor outdoor bar. And as you can see, it really opens up the space. It really creates or removes the sort of wall between the inside and the outside. And through some of the other pictures that you've seen um, and that you will see, you know, we, we, we use a lot of windows. Um, there's a little bit of a sort of, you know, sacrifice for insulation there, but just because of the size of the space, um, we feel that like that's appropriate. We can still get away with that. Um, another big sort of focus was uh, try to include everything you do need and try not to include anything you don't. <laughs> um, and that comes back down to a, a tiny space. So, um, you know, some of the just sort of little items, a little hard to see, but in the bottom right there, like in front of the sink, you'll notice there's we have a little flip up table. So after a little bit of time using the space, we realized like counter space was limited. Is there a way that we can, you know, add a little bit more counter space without um, getting in people's way, essentially? Um, as far as, you know, like the kitchen essentials, like knowing that people are going to be renting, what do we include for people um, that, that they're going to need and, and what can we sacrifice? And, you know, one of those sort of big ones for some people is being solar powered, we have a, a, a limited amount of power. So, we don't have coffee makers. We don't have any of the sort of electric kitchen appliances that the people would have, but we do, you know, there's alternatives for all of those. So we have French presses, um, we have like camp toaster. So finding ways to make sure that we could balance all that and, and have everything that we needed for people um, with sort of the limited, uh, the limited amount of power that we have. So everything is really a decision and we, and, and we really had to partly experience it and test it out. Um, but spend a lot of time thinking through like every part of a person's day in this cabin and how are they going to use it um, in order to decide how, you know, every little decision of every little part um, is included. And that was an, really an evolution over time. Um, and another big part for us, uh, and this is, you know, like I said, this was a core from the beginning. And, and like Laura mentioned herself as well is, you know, how can we really make these low impact um, minimum sort of carbon footprint, um, minimum impact on the environment. So, you know, one of our big arguments against um, or differentiators from being sort of a cottage rental is we're not clearing massive portions of the forest. 
Um, we're not digging up for foundations. Um, this is, it's basically a surface foundation. The only thing we really have to do is a, a gray water septic. And I mean, as far as septic goes, it's quite minimal. Um, so like we still have to do a little bit of digging. We still have to do a little bit of clearing, but um, again, like as you can see from this sort of bird's eye view of one of our cabins, um, you know, I, I think we took down like two or three trees to get this cabin in here. So we were really able to just from the physical footprint, minimize the impact, but also the fact that we're completely off grid. So we don't have to bring in water services. We don't have to bring in hydro services. Um, we're able to really keep it as a contained unit. Um, so sp speaking to solar specifically, um, we typically mount on the roof. Sometimes we mount elsewhere, but again, that that's, you know, because you're not running in hydro, it gives us access to, to areas that you otherwise wouldn't able to be able to get into. Um, and we don't have to run, you know, $10,000 a pole hydro poles, uh, to get power out there. Um, if you want to talk about <laughs> choices and making specific choices, materials, ends up being a, a really big part of it. Um, it's, it's amazing how, how many options you have um, with everything that you do. And for us, it's again, it, every choice is part of the sustainability. So uh, we you know, kind of decided to, to go with higher end, higher quality materials um, and try to minimize, um, try to minimize plastics, um, try to minimize the sort of stuff that would end up in landfill. So, as you can see on the interior, pretty much everything in here uh, is wood. Um, we've got pine board inside. Um, our, our outside siding is all we use uh, Mybeck siding. It's one of a few, you know, certain really good wood sidings um, and steel roofs. So, I mean, pretty much everything that's um, the exterior enclosure is, you know, 20 or 50 year warranties on them. So we know that they're going to last for a, a really long period of time. And I mean, I think just that in and of itself is a big part of the sustainability of the build is just ensuring that it's the build is going to last for a long time and that you're not going to have to be replacing things all the time. Um, another really, uh, really nice thing about this entire wood build on the interior is everything can be refinished. Um, so essentially, if, if things get damaged um, or worn down, you can literally just sand it down and um, put another you know, coat of varnish on it essentially. So just because somebody puts a hole in the wall, well, they're not gonna put a hole in these walls, but somebody damages the wall somehow, um, you know, it's, it's easily fixed. Um, so you don't have to, you know, things don't have to be disposable and things don't have to be um, replaced all the time. So you know, we're very confident that you know, 20 years from now with proper upkeep, these can look pretty much the same as they did you know, when we first built them. So that's a big, a big part of it for us is that we can, we can keep these in good shape um, and we're not constantly throwing up materials. Um, I mean, that said, um, you know, there, there's certain things that are, are, are challenges. Like the reality is, um, you know, solar is, is not or where it's at right now. Solar doesn't heat. Um, you know, we can't really heat a space, even a space this small without a massive amount of solar. So we are still dependent on, you know, propane, for pretty much anything to do with heat. So um, producing hot water, um, heating the actual cabin itself and, and the cooktop. Um, so we still have a, you know, a bit of a carbon output. Um, but again, this, the size of the space, you know, we're, we're using a very, very small amount relative to what something like a, a full size cottage or house would. So um, while we can't, we, we aren't quite there yet as far as a, you know, a zero impact carbon footprint, it's, we're, we're about as close as we feel that we can be. Um, and I'll let Laura talk a little bit about just some of the interior design and our, our interior design perspectives. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk quickly because I know we have to get into the Q&A. Uh, the interior design portion is something that I really love to do and is sort of my domain in the company. Um, you know, the cabins are beautiful with or without furniture. Um, so there's really not much that I have to do with interior design, but I very much do enjoy 
um, really special pieces in the cabin. I really enjoy uh, vintage hunting and going to Value Village and finding really unique mugs um, and teapots. Actually, that's your grandmother's teapot. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I love putting um, little pieces uh, in the cabins, um, blankets. Um, I also manage the social media. And um, as I spoke to you before, Instagram has been huge for our base. And I really enjoy collaborating with amazing local businesses. Uh, so in that previous photo, that blanket was supplied to us by Anapaya. It's a, a, a local uh, company in Ottawa. Um, and so we do a lot, we've done giveaways together. Um, and so this is just another photograph of some of the, the small little details that paddle on the wall is actually one of our old paddles that we painted ourselves. Uh, we love the little deer head. We, we put that on a lot of the cabins. Um, and books is something I love to have. I love curating our little tiny libraries in the cabins. Um, it's a partnership I actually recently started with Penguin Random House Canada. Um, they now supply a lot of the books in our in our cabins um, because we, we truly ran out of our own books. So I used to love taking our own books from our own personal library and we, we've run out of our own books. So um, that partnership with Penguin Random House has been wonderful. Um, so yeah, it, you know, unfortunately in these times of COVID, we've actually removed all of, all of the bedding and pillows from our cabins, but that was also something I really enjoyed doing is finding, um, you know, great throw pillows and blankets for the cabins. Um, but yeah, interior design, it's all about just small personal details that I think really make our cabins stand out. Um, and with that said, I think we're, we're sort of running out of time. So we'd love to get to some of your questions if you have some for us. Great presentation, uh, John and Laura. And yes, we do have a few questions. So we'll just get right into them because uh, people can feel free to type as we go. Um, first is, so what's the process to uh, visit if we want to visit or book? Mm -hmm. And where uh, are they located? I should admit that was also sure. in there. So. Uh, well, we have, so I mentioned Airbnb in the beginning. Um, that was in the beginning. We had two cabins on Airbnb, but we quickly realized that we did not need Airbnb and we started our own website. Uh, so all bookings uh, go through our website, which is www.cabinscape.com. Uh, so you can view all 12 of our cabins there. Um, we are quite booked up, um, but we do have some availability at, at some of our micro cabins. These are a new design, our tiniest cabins at Halliburton Forest. So you can visit our website. We're also on Instagram and Facebook. And then we roll forward bookings. So um, for example, on uh, the 1st of January, we'll open up the month of May. So yeah, on 1st of February. 1st of February, sorry. So on February 1st at 8 a.m., the month of May will be open. So each each month we open up on the first like that. Perfect. Um, growing interest in small homes and cabins and sustainable building practices. So there's a question here. Did you have to deal with any building code issues? Um, you mentioned about obviously the gray water um, that you had to deal with, but any issues around building code like the loft and steep stair access, for example, inside or anything outside? Yes, constantly. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the biggest challenge of our, yeah, our business. Yeah, I mean, that's that's been the biggest learning curve for sure. Um, and it's, you know, the building code is uh, is Ontario wide. Um, the, the main thing with that is it's still subject to interpretation um, as far as the, the building inspectors that you're dealing with or whether or not interpretation they, you know, a building inspector has the ability to, I don't want to say turn a blind eye, but kind of decide whether or not it, it, enforcement is that important in this scenario. Um, so we, a big part of it has been finding municipalities with building inspectors that are easy to work with. Um, with the CSA certification, it doesn't work like that at all. Um, CSA is 100% exactly how the how the rules are written. Um, so we, you know, certain designs where we're able to kind of make things work with building inspectors, we can't with CSA. Um, so it's it's really been like it's been three years of finding a way to thread the needle. Um, and it's the same with um, local bylaws, um, which are even more co complicated because every municipality has a different bylaw. Um, so finding municipalities that are easy to work with, um, that have you know bylaws that are workable, has been a big part of it as well. So there's a lot of places where we just know that we can't operate because the bylaw uh, doesn't permit it. Um, but finding the places that we can operate has been a, a very big part of the process over the past three years. Now I see that they're on. Uh 
they're mobile. I mean, you had to get them into their specific location. So they are mobile, but how long are they uh, fixated? Um, like they're there for the long term? And Yeah, I mean, we originally started building on trailers under the sort of false pretense that exists around the tiny home um, conversation that trailers makes it easier. In Ontario, it does not. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's parts of the States where it probably does. Um, so we actually travel on trailers and then take them off of the trailer for the most part. As far as duration, um, it's really a property to property scenario. Um, every sort of, we have a different lease with every different landowner. I mean, in a lot of cases, the intent uh, of both parties is that we'll be there indefinitely um, unless, you know, situations change. So we've only, of the 12 cabins we have, we've only had to move one once. And that was simply because okay. the landowner was changing their usage of the property, so. Any issues with any animals showing up? You're, th these are pretty remote, so. Uh, a, a mother bear and her cubs went right across, right in front of this cabin that we're looking at right wow. now. Wow, nice. Uh, the, the, guest, the guest messaged me about that and she, I, I didn't realize they were scared. I told them congratulations on the sighting. But, <laughs> um, so we, I mean, there's lots of wildlife around. We haven't had any real issues. No, no issues. Um, your typical like, you know, insects and like all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, no, we haven't had any, any major problems. So is there any specific plans for booking? Like, you know, what about birthday celebrations or Valentine's, like any marketing specialties that you've kind of done? To... We, uh, we recently actually hired a full-time customer experience. Uh, ah. curator, yeah. Um, and her focus is building these types of packages, um, because it's something that we've been hearing from our guests that they want. Um, so a new package that she recently created uh, was is our celebration package. And uh, she has partnered with some great local organizations like a Perth chocolate, the, the Perth chocolate uh, store, um, Grange Winery and uh, um, a apropos florists in Perth um, and a professional photographer. So with that package, you come to the cabin and you have a professional photographer take um, professional photos of, of whatever occasion you're celebrating. And then on top of that, you get all of these lovely um, treats uh, with, your, with your vacation. Um, and then of course, we're working on all different sorts of uh, new experiences and upgrades. Uh, to get people out, also outside of the cabin, right. you know, climbing experience or an ice fishing experience. So that's sort of the next level of our business. The, these last three years have been really focused on the cabins, but, um, you know, moving forward, we're really trying to add on services and experiences to upgrade our, our, our guests' overall experience. So we've still got a, a, a couple of minutes left. So if anybody wants to put a question in the Q&A, by all means, go ahead and do it or just write into the chat box. I'm just going to keep rolling through. So regarding the off-grid systems, do you have any like backup generators or what's the specifics on the batteries? You mentioned you can't have some, you know, you don't have a kettle, but yeah, what, what's the... Well, we yeah. have a kettle. We have a stove Well, we have a stove pot kettle, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the solar uh, is, is pretty good in the summer. Um, depending on the location. Uh, in the winter, it's a little more challenging. Um, so typically at all the cabins, we do have a backup generator uh, that the guests can run and the generator charges, it just charges the batteries directly. So okay. the everything is still run off of the solar system. Um, the only thing that, that runs off of the generator is we do have a like an emergency electric heater in the event that there's some sort of a, a heating failure and then you can run the generator and run that, that backup heater. So that's just kind of like a the backup system but the solar is like at this mica cabin here the one that the picture that you're looking at because of um uh the amount of sun exposure that it gets in the wind in the summer you never have to run the generator um in the winter when the sun's lower and sometimes snow is challenging you know you need to run the generator sometimes in order to basically charge just charge the batteries back up okay sounds good now um, I'm going to skip ahead to one. Where can one find such packages and what are the rates? Um, they mentioned the the website is uh, www.cabinscape.com. You can click that and it's right in the chat box. You can find all that information there. Are you building any more cabins right now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we've got about five sitting in the lot uh, at the factory right now. Um, so like Laura said, we've got uh, easily going to have 10 out um, by midsummer. Um, depending on how, how everything goes with, I mean, COVID right now and everything yeah. else. 
supply chain uh, you know issues that have been hampering us and, and all that kind of stuff but we should have another t easily 10 to 15 cabins out by by next fall yeah. okay i'm gonna i'm gonna go with one last question that there's actually we probably could take this a whole other half hour um because i'm starting to see more and more questions coming in but um so congratulations to you both for this but uh just in terms of the design philosophy what was the biggest challenge you had while working on this so you obviously you've learned a lot you've done quite a few but what's the biggest challenge design challenge i guess i mean i don't know i mean meeting code or finding a way to meet code is probably one of the the biggest challenges um uh, i mean that's kind of a technical challenge i don't know that's a design yeah. challenge from the other side it's it's just dealing with the the limited space um yeah. so finding creative ways um to make sure that you know there's a place for everything and everything's in its place and and that people are going to have you know the little spaces and nooks and crannies and storage and all that kind of stuff that that they're going to need when when they visit do you guys live in a tiny house no no, <laughs> no. no but we're happy to visit them i mean i i, I yeah. we I've, couldn't live in a tiny yeah house, i mean no. i've said from the beginning like it's i think for it takes a special person to live in one i think um okay. but I think it's really great as a, it's def, not that you shouldn't live in one if, if you're that special person, but um, I think it's really great as a, definitely as a getaway. And for like, I think this is a really, you know, perfect use for it where people are there for two or three days um, and, and, and we can still keep the overall footprint small of our, of our offering. Well, listen, this is a fantastic business. You seem like a fantastic couple. I'm really glad this is working out for you and I'm glad you've got more on the go. So uh Thank you very much. And for all the attendees, thank you all very much for joining us today. And again, make sure you go to their website at www.cabinscape.com. That's where you can get uh, more information, probably answers to some of the questions. And uh, well, who knows, we might, uh, people might be bumping into each other from Algonquin at these various places. So very much appreciate your time today, John and Laura. Thank 